everyone. I'm here today with my very dear Urubayan brother, Shurjo, who's speaking to us from Ananda Mubla. Hello, Shurjo. <laughs> Hi, Asha. Thank you for having me. It's very nice to be here. I want to tell everyone that Shurjo recently did a, a long podcast for New York City, Ananda New York City, which you can find on their website. And he talked a great deal about how he came to Ananda and so on. So I'm going to skip over that a little faster. Also, being the esteemed husband of Narayani. <laughs> no, that's what I'm better known as. <laughs> yes, well, it's half and half now. But in any case, a great deal of his story is also in her book. So unlike some of the people I've talked to, where they're completely unknown, there's more known about Sir John. I, I would like him to talk to us also about India, what's happening in India now, what their work is, and so on. But first, we'll start with Sir Joe, you know, who were you before you met Master? <laughs> Who was I? Well, I was totally lost. I was a lazy bum. <laughs> oh. I was, I was just so in my head. But uh, mostly I was very, very unhappy. When I talk to my mother now, she tells me, you know, because I've said this a few times in public, just talking about my childhood days that I was deeply unhappy, dissatisfied with life. And my mother always says to me, you know, you now say that you're unhappy. I had no idea you were unhappy. You never said you were unhappy. You never projected unhappiness because I was a very good boy. You know, I listened to my parents. I was good at my studies and I, I, I kept my head, you know, down and I just stay stuck to the track that that is the Indian, you know, childhood. Um, but inwardly, I was just so, I don't know, just always feeling, I mean, I disliked going to school greatly. As a fun story of mine that my mother would bring up whenever she has eager ears around her, is when I was in my third grade, I would wake up in the middle of the night at say around 2 a.m., sneak into my parents' bedroom and turn the alarm clock off, you know, just press that little button on top. <laughs> and my mother would wake up, you know, late. And so therefore she would have to rush us to get us ready for school. And once we got to miss school because of that. So this was my agenda. I didn't want to go to school. I felt no need to be there. It always brought my energy down. So throughout my childhood, whereas outwardly, I was a very well functioning, you know, active, good boy, but inwardly, I was deeply, deeply dissatisfied. And it came to a, you know, a climatic uh, close, my dissatisfaction, and I finally got to express it was when I was in high school, it was in my 11th and 12th grade, but I expressed it kind of saying, I really, really need to know what's going on because nothing seems to make sense to me. And at that time, I decided I'm not going to put out any effort into my studies anymore. And so it was the first time my grades dropped. And it was a little wake up mo moment for my mom to think, what's happened to my, <laughs> to my good little boy? <laughs> Why is he, you know, doing so badly at school? And it was then that I first came upon a book. Um, it was by Richard Bach. It was called Illusions. And uh, it was in that book where there was this little story of the, a messiah. And this messiah, you know, constantly helps a lot of people, keeps healing people in the hope that he's, you know, helping them and uplifting them. But he realizes that the same people who asked for healing yesterday have come back today and they want something else and they come back the next day and they want something else. And after a while, it dawns on to him that I'm not really helping anybody. <laughs> and so he kind of gets away from the crowds, goes out into a mountain and has an inner conversation with God. They don't really share the conversation. But when he comes back, the crowds are, you know, they're more fierce than before. Heal me, help me do this, do that. And he says, OK, I'm happy to do anything and everything for you but i want you first to answer a few questions of mine and so everybody's listening intently and he says what if god were to ask you were to come to you and ask you to suffer in his name now of course that's a christian concept so you know the suffering of christ and everybody says of course we'll suffer for god if he asks us we'll suffer 
and the Messiah says, but really suffer, go through a lot of hardship, but God is right with you. He's asking you, you know, he's right in front of you, conversing with you, asking you to suffer. Will you suffer? And everybody says, yes, you know, as a, as a means to show how devoted they are to God and his will, they all say, yes, we will suffer. And then he says, okay, and what if God were to be this close to you, stare right into your eyes and ask you to be happy as long as you live? What would you do? And there was silence in the crowd. <laughs> and that moment, suddenly it struck me that I'm not in charge of my own happiness. I'm not in control of my happiness. I'm so deeply dissatisfied. And it started me on the process that I need to kind of become happy. I can no longer do this. And then one thing led to another. I was in college. I studied fashion um, from a, a premier institute in India. And uh, there I was introduced to the autobiography of a yogi, which was interestingly in my own home. I read the book and I said, okay, <laughs> found it. But uh, before that, I went through a lot of reading. I went into the Indian scriptures in great length. I read the Bible. I really opened myself for the first time to God because uh, I was raised more or less an atheist. So I didn't have the concept of God. Um, but it was finally I said, okay, that's where... Uh, my joy is going to come from but then master found me you know in the mix of the confusion of so many scriptures and so many theories and so many ways to approach God I'm glad that you know he plucked me out and so that was my life and when I read the autobiography it was my second year in college and I just knew I said I'm gonna give my life to this man I didn't know what that meant but I knew that was gonna happen and then you met Swamiji when? Um, so I read the book and of course I was only aware of SRF YSS. Um, so in my mind there was a vague concept that I would you know, show up at their doorstep and say I want to be a monk and they would joyfully accept me and rejoice in having me. Uh -huh. um, but I never put out any energy into finding out where are these guys do they have a monastery how do they live let me go see them um, I had subscribed to their lessons but I couldn't get into them I just couldn't figure out how to practice Hong so I couldn't figure out how to energize because the words you know were just words and I didn't have enough of an understanding to really make them practical to me but uh, it was again my mother who read an article about Ananda in a magazine that she wrote for and she said oh you know there's this other organization and they're following the teachings of uh, Yogananda as well and there's a direct disciple and I don't know what it was but somehow hearing about Ananda I felt for the first time I want to check this place out I want to see who these people are which for some reason I didn't do with uh, SRF and YSS and so uh, Swami was, um, you know, they had just bought that land outside Pune and there was going to be the Bhumi Pujan over there. And so I went down to Pune and uh, I met the monks for the first time and I saw Swamiji for the first time and I just felt, all right, this is it. And I, I had maybe four months left for my college to end. And so the day my college then ended, I did pack my bags and I did show up at the doorstep of the monastery at Ananda <laughs> and they did rejoice in having me. <laughs> um, sure, Joe, when, when you first met Swamiji, did he make any impression on you? Did it just go past? How did it it went, it went past, past me primarily because I didn't even understand the concept of a direct disciple. I and I was so fixated on Master uh -huh. um, that... I didn't really see, I didn't know what a direct disciple was, I didn't know how much power of Master Swamiji held. And as I said, I, I really came from not a very uplifted state, you know, in college. Drugs, alcohol, laziness, just complete lack of any purpose in life just had eaten into me completely. And even despite me awakening my spiritual aspirations the environment of college just did not allow me to really express them mm -hmm. so i i think i came with a very dull awareness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, it only started to clarify once i got to ananda and how i recognize swamiji because when i 
first saw him and then when I moved to Ananda, he was not there. He had moved on to a CC in America as he always did to the other communities. And so it was another six months after I actually joined Ananda that I then saw Swamiji. Mm -hmm. Really, because the first time I saw him was in public on the stage at a distance. I never got to really connect with him or speak to him in any way. Narayani was the first person I met when I landed in Pune, interestingly. <laughs> um, <laughs> she was busy doing, setting up the altar and my mother and I walked up to her and said, can we help you? And Narayani in her sweet accent, of course you can help me put these candles. <laughs> so <laughs> our fates were already intertwined from that moment. But yeah, Swamiji, it took me a while really. And um, it's, I think I myself had just a lot to, a lot of veils to really uh, discard before I could appreciate Swami for who he was. And I'm still doing that. Yes, of course, aren't we all? That yeah. I understand. I, okay, so eventually, and not too, too late, it, in 2012 is when you married Narayani, yes? Yes, so for October. The last, for the last uh, six, seven months of Swamiji's life, then you also mm -hmm. just lived in his house, house as she did, yes? Yes. If, um, so how do you think that that experience has impacted you? <laughs> I think that's for the first time I really began really understanding what I was doing even there, what discipleship meant, because up till that time, I mean, and still you make so much stuff up. You're just, I mean, there's so much pretension in, in discipleship, not in, a, not in a negative way, but just because we have no idea what we're doing. And so even until, you know, it, it had been three, four years that I was really solidly living in Ananda. I was a monk. I had given my life, you know, it was this and nothing else. And, but it was only when I got to be around Swami that I learned to relax, I think, a little bit more into just opening myself. I think I was too closed uh, before. Uh, and Narayani helps me with that too, just because she has that a similar vibration to what Swamiji had. But you saw it in its highest manifestation in him and you, you couldn't help but say, okay, that's what it's supposed to look like. And I think it was the first time because otherwise my interactions with Swami were so limited uh, throughout my time as a young monk. It, you know, was mostly public every now and then in some little private groups. But to tell you the truth, I don't think I stood out even a little bit. So, so I see no reason for him to have even. So I, I was very surprised because when Narayani shared with Swamiji the process she and I were going through in trying to figure out is this something that's real or is this just another, you know, desire and a delusion that has really caught hold of us. And Swami actually wanting us to be together was quite surprising, but it also helped me appreciate him for so much more because given the fact that I was a nobody in at least in my own minds, and yet he, he saw so impersonally what each individual needed and didn't see them in any, in any preconceived way. And he elevated me to the point where I got to, you know, be around him all the time. I, I can't imagine that was easy for him just because of, you know, at the moment, not only was he merging with God more and more, his body, his age, the need that he had both on a physical level and on a spiritual level, the vibrational need that he had, that I feel Narayani was, you know, a ver part of very few people who could fulfill that for him. And, you know, enter me into that, into that whole situation. And I'm not sure whether I really added to it or was Swami, this was Swami's last selfless act to save this, you know, ignorant boy. But uh, I mean, I'm grateful for it. And I, I'm trying my best now to live up to that. I think that's the best way to think of it. Hmm. You know, he, uh, yes, I, I understand what you're saying. I understand perfectly what you're saying. When yeah. I look back myself through the 70s and 
I think of what I was like and how generous he was and how he saved my life, as simple as that. And, you know, he saw potential rather than, than actuality. <laughs> yeah, That's true. Looking back now, I mean, you can see that because I mean, it so happens that uh, the service that we now provide, well, it's, it's meaningful, to say the least. Um, so, yeah, I'm grateful that he was able to draw that out because I'm not sure if I had the capability of discovering it for myself. And I, I know that, I mean, as Narayani writes in her own book, you know, that Narayani would need help and you could help mm -hmm. her, meaning that what you can do together is different. So why don't you speak for a moment about, because you are a couple serving master together, Mm -hmm. sort of how, what does that feel like? I mean, the traditional image in you yourself, I'm serious about the spiritual path, I'm going to be a monk. And then instead you end up being uh, having a partner, being a couple working together. Is there anything unique about that that you would comment on or how that works? I mean, first, well, just, just explain, because most people know, but you all run the Mumbai Center there, yes? We run the Mumbai Center, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think... We're so fortunate in, in a way that both of us are so clear mm -hmm. about what our lives really mean. So in certain ways, it's not that different from my life as a brahmachari. Oh. In, in the power of the, you know, the absolute direction that my life needs to take, our lives need to take. However, of course, now you've got another reality because as again as a brahmachari you read the autobiography you saw you know as swami says master is a monk so i'm going to be a monk and for some of us that's just kind of dawning on a coat that doesn't quite fit us but you know it's it's in style so why not um so that was the idea i didn't quite really know what any of it means so let's be a monk and i mean i loved i loved 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 uh, that experience, but I was already so self-involved, <laughs> you know, I was already so both sure of myself and completely ignorant at the same time and knowing both those realities existed. I think Narayani has drawn so much out of me that uh, it would have been harder for me to get to this point. But um, at the same time, as I'm saying, it just doesn't feel very different because the flow of our life is just, it's so, you know, we really have blinders on and in the best way possible. It's like there's there's nothing, nowhere else to look. Um, and the other thing we're, I'm very grateful for, we're both grateful for, is when Swami created the Naya Swami order and he gave clarity to that lifestyle. So there was no ambiguity of, okay, so we're married, does that mean something else? And does, should my life be different? Should it look different now because I'm married? But Swami really helped us kind of cut through that fog and said, nothing changes, you know. And from the moment we were married, Swami kept asking us, when are you going to take the Tyagi vows? When are you going to take the Tyagi vows? I, I want you to take the Tyagi vows. So you could see he didn't want us kind of wandering, you know, kind of thinking that, okay, now we're together and this is our time together. And he just didn't want any of that. He wanted us to take the energy that we carried as brahmacharis, the clarity we carried as brahmacharis and immediately put it into this new expression of our lives where again, nothing has changed. And I, I truly believe nothing has changed except um, Narayani has been able to draw out from me things that I desperately needed and I continue to need and the the friction that is a natural process of any two individuals is in my case especially very very beneficial for me so I don't know if it's necessarily for others but uh, I couldn't have made a better choice Swami couldn't have made a better choice for us That's, I understand that how does it inform when you're working with the public, which you, I mean, now we're all just working through the internet, but when you and Narayani serve as a couple, how, how, does, the, how does the flow work? How do you see it? But how do, 
do you see that what you're able to do is more because you're working together or different mm -hmm. because you're working together? Much more and different at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think we're both able to bring our unique strengths rather than trying to have to be too many things and trying to have to do too many things and failing at certain things and really bringing so much balance because again people relate to us better because of the fact that we're a couple so there's a little bit more there's naturally a certain worldliness you know for a lack of a better world, word that comes in because you have to take care of each other there's compromise there's realities that as a as an individual as a single person i could you know sure you want to eat eat let me just have you know whatever's freely available now so, no, we have to cook and we have to maintain a nice home it has to be clean <laughs> you know cleanliness wasn't big on my list of things to do when i was a young monk so it, there's just these natural kind of uh, flows that are created when you're living a married life and so it allows us to relate so much better to people and it also allows people to relate to us in ways where they feel very comfortable and they can approach Narayani when it's a certain kind of you know support that they need they approach me when they need a certain kind of support I think I mean without sounding um, uh, presumptuous I think we bring a good blend of wisdom and heart mm -hmm. and uh, I I don't know I, I feel people enjoy that and they appreciate that no I think that that's an absolute truth certainly one of the greatest needs of our age is to bring harmony and stability back into relationships and into into family life I mean does I, I don't want to make you too self-important about it but does that mm -hmm. feel like something that, that you feel drawn to do? Do you feel called to sort of help serve in that way or is that incidental? I think that's incidental. Mm -hmm. um, however, we do, we do try to draw out of people. We try to bring, you know, usually we see this as a pattern everywhere. One, one of the couple tends to, you know, have a spiritual aspiration and the other doesn't. Mm -hmm. But somehow Narayani and I, I think we're also both um, just so much relaxed. We're not fanatical about our lifestyle. We're not imposing about the choices that we've made that we can really relate to the, you know, uh, the spouse who is not spiritual, so to speak, and make them feel very relaxed. And since we're young, I think that helps a lot because people feel, well, <laughs> you know, these young, they're not, they've not kind of lived a life of fulfillment and now kind of gone. So they're uh, asking us somehow to avoid that step. But they're, you know, they're true to what they believe in. Yet you don't see them kind of asking the same of us. And we feel very comfortable in involving you know, couples, uh, especially where one is and one isn't, mm -hmm. in a way where they feel very relaxed. But that that happens more naturally. I don't think we think about that as that's part of you know the the role that we ought to be playing. It just it just seems to happen. I think because our personalities just allow that to happen. Allow that to happen. I'm going to switch to a different question. How mm -hmm. do you feel? I mean, Swami now has been out of his body for seven years. How do, how do you feel his role in your life? <laughs> well, I, I know everybody says that, that we all feel Swami more than we've felt him perhaps in ways when he was in the body. But it's not so much for me because he's become more accessible in, you know, now that he's not in the form. I'm sure that's a part of it. But... I think in really serving and giving my life to this work, I have naturally attuned to him because that's all he was. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, it's like he's there. If, if you're not doing that, then it's like I have to work on, okay, Swami, where are you? And you know, I have to find other ways. But because the, our lives are so just master and nothing and Swami is just a part of that I mean it's hard to even say master and Swami as two different flows anymore mm -hmm. 
just because it's it's hard to feel them differently yeah and so when you're giving it, it because my commitment to this path has it's not deepened because i feel from day one i i knew this is it but it's it's become more and more clear and i'm able to give more and more as a, as opposed to before i wanted to give but i was unable to give because again those those veils just stopped me or didn't allow that energy to flow as clearly as fully so as i feel that's happening i know it's swami doing that because the seven months that i got to spend with him they weren't like oh my goodness and and now i'm just with him and he's told me so much and he's filled me with so much you know a lot of it was just watching movies with him and sometimes just having a meal with him and i mean there was no there was no overt interaction where he really looked into my eyes and you know he told me that one thing that i needed to hear that switched everything so it's like he's just seeped in so subtly as as christ said like a thief in the night from the back door <laughs> you know so he's just he's just seeping in more and more and um the process now is just is the allowing him to seep in more and more and that's where i think the fun of our spiritual lives have really begun to to hit me i've started to realize that this is fun because you can feel how a saint takes over you you feel consciousness descending as a reality and no longer as a, a vague hope oh that's just that's just perfect i really enjoy it. that huh. that's a lot how i feel it too it's not dramatic it's just no it's not <laughs> i wish it were but <laughs> It was dramatic for me when I was in seclusion writing about him. Yeah. But most of my life he's just there. It's just it's because we're living his life, so we live it his way. Exactly. Yeah. Well, those are the perfect words, I guess. Yeah. So so now you are there in Mumbai and until we were all put into lockdown. Mhm. Mm we're running a small center there. What, yeah. How, what do you think you you are indian born but i know that you have a lot of international experience but what do you think how do you think master's teachings fit into india right now well first and foremost the one thing that we're all experiencing is the oversaturation of the spiritual life that's out there mm -hmm. you've got healers you've got Three billion different paths. You've got life coaches. You've got you know. I mean, the names change and evolve and sound more and more professional and corporatey. But the concept is that uh, you know, I know a lifestyle that will help you. And so, a we find ourselves to be a small little drop in that ocean of <laughs> of options. Uh -huh. Yet the more you watch that ocean. you realize how salty that water is you know it's just <laughs> it's it's like you can see the 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 depth of master's teachings and you can see the ripples and the waves that have been drawn out from them that have been transformed into parts of their own so it's almost like you can see master's hand in it you know we talked to you about the saint that sometimes we would see and how he would just talk about baba ji's just guiding it all and that's his you know it's his consciousness and absolutely everything but when we asked him that oh, okay so if baba ji's consciousness is in everything that means baba ji's pretty much directing all these zigillion you know different spiritual paths because he wants the consciousness of the world to be uplifted you know this is our a natural thought okay since there's so many options it's just so that as many more people can be uplifted in this process and, but then he said oh no no baba ji is not giving his energy you know to all these paths there must be a handful of paths that baba ji gives his energy to and then he says and of course yours is one of them and so you can see master baba ji this lineage again it's just so hard to separate each of these names 
um, you can see the the direction they have kind of given Dwapara Yoga and you can see the natural variations of that direction but it feels like sooner or later these waves will subside it just feels that way because you can't see them sustained a lot of them don't even practice what really they're talking about but you see that a lot of um, you know the waves at least they create commotion and excitement and energy mm -hmm. so it almost feels like that's what's going on and when that subsides it's like you know the 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 teachings of of babaji especially through this path will just be the most visible reality i don't know when that will happen but it's a it's a very real feeling that that is that just feels like that's what's meant to be also because and one thing now with this particular lockdown situation that we are in life's really not that hard i know there is a whole um, strata of people who are suffering greatly during this time but those aren't the people who are as it is interested in any of these paths the people who are interested in spirituality today as we define spirituality are people who are already you know well established in life at least with the basics everyone has enough money has a home has the car has a job so they're all people who have and because they have they're able to see what lies beyond having and if this hasn't satisfied me there must be more and so their seeking begins but whether that's real yet or not a situation like this where it's not really gotten bad but if it were to get worse than it is that's when true spirituality will be tested for each of us oh sure i love god and i believe in god perfectly but that's because you know i have my meals to eat i have a place to stay it's a, it's not hard to love god when life's not that bad you know sure i i get upset and i get angry and i fight with my wife or my kids or whatever but at the end of the day my conveniences exist and i exist in the way that i would like it i watch my netflix i can go wherever i can buy things and so i think a moment will come masters talked about this swami's talked about it where that's when spirituality will be tested first the world has to be tested where you weed out lower consciousness then you have to weed out <laughs> the lower of the higher consciousness and and then what will remain will be those who know god is the only reality despite whatever i don't have a home god's the only reality i don't have money god's the only reality and that's when i think that's the preparation i feel we are on not because we're waiting for something bad to happen is just what we've been called to do in this lifetime is to prepare the way even if we don't see it in our own lives that's marvelous thank you very much thank you shirjo that was a very interesting and uh, enlightening sharing thank you so, um just so that people know if you go if you google into mumbai india ananda mumbai that's what it is and on the one Mumbai, you'll find Sergio and Mariani all over the internet these days and uh if you enjoyed what you heard here and Mariani has this wonderful book called My Heart Remembers Swami Kriyananda about the years that she was his personal companion and caregiver mm -hmm. so i recommend all of it and thank you very much Sergio for sharing it was really a joy to be with you Dr. thank you Asha it's really a pleasure always always not enough time together never <laughs> never